Hello, welcome to Tiger's Size Blah 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 podcast. Back for another episode. I'm Luke Flanagan, and my co-host Rich Walker is here. Hello. Then. Um, a few things to go through today. We've, again, we've abandoned the good, the bad, and the number because we ain't where seen do, much. Where do you go with the good? Yeah, <laughs> we ain't seen it, mate. So, and the only important number was zero. That's it. The, the of number goals of goals scored, and the number of and points. The most important games of the season. Yeah. So there you go. Um, yeah, there's that number, zero. Both of those. <laughs> and both goods, shit. Um, or nothing. <laughs> so that's a good start. And then we'll just get into the bad. Although we're trying to... Well, a few things we'll discuss today. What I um, mean, if we could just touch on the lack of a good thing. And, mm. You know, it is hard at the moment to be a whole City fan, isn't it? It's really mm. difficult. And we yeah. don't want this to be something where people are tuning in and it's like, Oh God, more misery! Because it's bad enough. Like if you if you're engaged with City in any way on social media, you know you're in a fans forum on Facebook for some reason. Maybe you like the nice artwork they put together, but that's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, or you're on Twitter. You know you you're engaged with the hashtag. It's it's yeah. miserable. It's miserable reading at the minute, and it's not fun. So we don't want to be like you know right. Let's get tucked straight into the negative and we'll smash the players like. no no we are going to look at uh, the game as a more rounded thing which is why we don't do it straight after the game because I think there's, there's a very very uh, high chance that we would be completely depressed yeah we, if we recorded it an hour after the game we'd still be angry yeah you'd st- you your emotions would still be running high so we don't want to be getting stuck into people but you yeah, know yeah. at the moment that's where we are isn't it that's what mm. we've got to talk about mm. is is how bad we are. <laughs> mm, so we're going to talk about the Luton game <clears throat> and issues around that and then maybe just kind of have a brief mention of the Cardiff game, which seems a little bit of a foregone conclusion and a bit pointless now, really, but we've still got to play it. Yeah, I mean, so, what, it, what is it? Like a 40, 45 to 1 chance of it turning apparently, out? But yeah, I mean, I looked at doing it on the betting slip and it came out 100 and something, but you actually need double chance because sometimes they don't like we don't need one team to win. They could draw or lose. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. The eventualities, <clears throat> excuse me, are a little bit skewed the other way. So that's what um, Phil Buckingham had said. It was around forty-five to one. Well, all the all the results going our way and City winning. No, now look, it'll be all the results go our way and we we'll still fucking lose. <laughs> it's probably still worth putting that bet on and just leaving City. Uh, oh god, <laughs> that would be so. 2020. <laughs> it would be, wouldn't it? So City, so 2020. Yeah. Everything goes our way and we still can't do the one job that we have. <laughs> Just before we get tucked into the episode, a um, couple of uh, thank yous. Sponsors, Hull City Ladies, Daddy Johnson. So obviously we'll get to see them hopefully soon. We're going to get the season. Uh, another lower leagues of the men's leagues have been announced today. So yes, Hull City yeah. Ladies will be um, not far behind, I would have thought. Oh. Fingers crossed, I know they're talking about getting grassroots football back. Mm. Um, it's August the 2nd, they can start friendlies. So. Yeah, um, so Go obviously we're all, we're all keen for that to, to mm. happen. I mean, a lot can happen over a short space of time in you know, the current mm. circumstances, but fingers crossed, everything uh, everything remains on track. Yep, um, indeed. And then, obviously, the other one's uh, Fan Hub Football, our partners. Uh, that's an app that should be launched in the next couple of months. Um, which recognises and rewards fans for putting their football club first. The hashtag is fans first, and there's a link in our bio to them, so just have a look at that. Um, it's free to sign up, and basically it'll be an app that offers fans rewards the more games they go to, basically, when it's uh, when it's launched. So that's a good initiative to get behind. Uh, we'll be back in a second with the start of the episode. Don't go anywhere. Right, so if we uh, make a start, I think the first thing that we talked about um, w- that you wanted to discuss first, Rich, was the change in approach from McCarran's team. Yes. Um... Um, so the floor's all yours. I'll add in <laughs> when I think there's anything that I feel needs adding in. So I'm sure I mean, it, might, it might be something that um, we don't discuss that much, but I just mm. thought it was interesting that he waited until the 45th game of the season to kind of alter the way that 
we we were attacking Luton, you know, mm-hmm. looking looking to score goals. It it seemed to me a very different approach from um, what we previously employed. You know, trying to trying to counter wide and um, you know maybe play a little bit more through midfield and then you know hit the hit the spaces in behind teams where and when they they came up, which has been you know mm. increasingly um, rare. As, as the season's gone on but it seemed like we went a little bit more direct um for you know that one of the first times i can't remember another time this season where mcginnis and eves have played together it, it it might be that somebody can prove me wrong on that um but to see the two of them on the same team sheet was interesting well, that. i think I was... a lot of people expected that there would be wholesale changes you know to the system as yeah. well as bringing in different players um because mm. you know Seeing uh, the likes of Ingram start was a shock, and Tafazoli playing was a shock. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think we, you know, a few people thought, "God, has he changed it completely?" But you, there was just something about it. You know, I'd spoken previously about McGuinness playing wide. And it just seemed to me that that would be the case. But then, even having said that, we lined up four three three. Yeah. Which you know we don't know. Yeah. We've never done that. <laughs> Look yeah. how I'm thinking. I was absolutely flawed about that. But it just yeah. seemed like we'd gone a little bit more direct to try and get as many balls into the box as we possibly could. Um I was fine with that. Yeah, I was, and I didn't think it you know, it didn't look too bad in, in the first half. I mean the standard of the game was horrendous. Um no, and the was, first it half was two very, very poor sides, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And I think in the first half you could say that each side was as bad as the other. Um, I didn't think anybody stood out. So it looked like, you know, to a degree, having been pasted at Wigan uh, only a few days before, kind of a back-to-basics approach, to my mind, was, you know, not necessarily the wrong thing to do if you just isolated it to that circumstance. But then when you looked at it from the point of view of it being the biggest game of the season and a must-win, the longer the game went on, it looked... Like maybe it might not be the right thing to do, but mm. like I say, I was just interested that he made that change to go back to basics this late in the season. When really, and I think David Burns has said this to him on Humberside after the game when he's been speaking to him that it's too late when he's allowed to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. After uh, that grilling he gave him after. Um... Which game was it? Was it the Millwall game? It was, yeah. Um, um, to be fair, Burns, he did get his chance as well after um, the game on Saturday. Yeah. But like I say, it was just, you know, getting crosses into the box and, and, and trying to be a little bit more direct. And, you know, I think Brian Hughes said on commentary, you know, trying to get those entries into the... He didn't use posi- position of maximum opportunity, you know, as no. as such, because that would be like, really outdated. I think that's like a sixties like coaching mantra. But that was effectively the the thing that we were trying to do. Um and when it when the ball went out right hand side and we were trying to get it into the box, McGuinness was drifting in and trying to really cause, you know, centre backs problems. And yeah. I was you know, there was something in that. There was something in it. I could see the method. Um but to me it was just to, to leave it that late all right, it was a dog, like an absolute dog of a game. So maybe um, it wasn't the right approach, but to change it and maybe go back to basics, be horrible to play against. There was mm. something in that. Did he pick his time right? I'm not sure. No. Um, I mean, like you say, when you know, you're know surprised to get Eves and McGuinness together, I thought he'd put, them two up top when I saw this when I looked at the team but then when you looked at it again you were like well <clears throat> he's probably going to play one of them out wide isn't he and that's yeah, exactly th- what he did there were a few things about it that didn't quite add up to a a four four two. you know like there uh, wasn't enough players to, to justify that there were three midfielders yeah um, unless, unless, unless he was going to play man. If he was going to play Hunnin and wide, because I know he played there a little bit for Sunderland, but the the reports around that weren't exactly glowing. So it's kind no. of one of those things. He like he's either sticking four three three, in which case he's he's going to get criticised for that, or he's fitting square pegs in round holes, and yeah, that's not the way either. No, um, you know the other changes like Ingram didn't really show himself. To, you know, it, it 
either way. Um, he didn't you know. really get tested that much. The second half, he did a bit, and he he made a couple of you know routine stops. But yeah, the and... goal the goal was disappointing for me. It was just, I mean, where, where have we had it? Where a substitute changes the game? It doesn't. We we don't get that. But that's exactly what did happen because it was pretty dull and dour, wasn't it? And he's he's chucked Lua 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 on, and he's yeah. he was he was lively, wasn't he? He was. I mean, I was watching the game with my uncle. It's first time I've watched the game with anybody since um, yeah, since the restart, which since was everything's nice. happened. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was almost like um, kind of getting the the enjoyable part of football back for me. Um, mm. Yeah, because you like you, you you bounce ideas off people. So there sometimes that you might miss something. That's not a criticism of anybody in particular. But you, you might go, oh, "This is shit," or "I'm not liking the way this is," and somebody else might go, "Yeah, but." If he does that, then something else. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. It's, it's bouncing just ideas off people, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. If 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 as as it was on Saturday, the game's crap. You're watching it with somebody. It makes all the difference. Uh, yeah. To my mind, like football's as much a social thing as it is a sporting thing. Yeah. Um. But anyway, as, as we were saying, like when the wire the came on, I, I turned to him and I was like, uh oh. <laughs> you, know, you could see it coming. Just that little bit of pace and directness was was. Yeah, there, there was a couple of warnings, weren't there? Yeah, I mean, you know, so when he comes on, you're thinking that could be one that makes a difference. And then, of course, he he's the man that scores the goal. And, and if you're a Luton fan, you're looking at it and thinking it's a great goal because he's taken the man on in midfield and then he's shot Defense from distance. Step, stepping off him again, just leaving like, yeah, him in the room to do it. Well, how often have we said that? Edge of the area shots and no defence come out to him. Batty's not really got close enough and, and then no. to beat him it's like a simple step over. But like if we relate it to Ingram, should he get beat from there? He shouldn't, in my eyes. He I, don't, I don't think so. It, I'm not saying it looks routine, but you look at, at where it's he's shooting from. It's not that corner, it's not. Well, it's not it's even not gone in the bin. corner. It's not it's in not the corner. Bin, as they say. It's just sort of to the right of the goal. It's yeah. sort of along the floor. It's not the, exactly, you know, the the most powerfully struck ball. It's 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 no. it's almost more like he's he's taken the shot early and maybe caught him off guard, which you know we can happen. It's, you know, Abel Hernandez has done that for us. At, yeah, at Derby yeah. in the first leg of the playoffs, like that. Oh beautiful. yeah, good goal that though. Yeah, I mean that, that was, that, was the, that that was a good goal. It wasn't the, bad keeping with that. It was a fantastic finish. So maybe maybe we're we're looking at. at Something like that, but Hernandez's goal was like right in the corner, and and Luar Luar is almost like there's still two or three yards in from the post. So to me, you have to ask questions of him. I'm not I'm not sure he yeah. should get beat from there. No. Um. So you know that that change maybe went against him, but I don't know. And then the others, um, McDonald and and um, Tafazoli. Tafazoli didn't have bad games. No. Um, but they, no, they weren't. No. They weren't really tested. Uh, and then the other, the other lads have really all played, you know, a fair bit to 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 look at them and say their inclusion wasn't necessarily a shock. Um, mm-hmm. I just think the other shot was was McGuinness in in a wide position. Um, yeah, it was a very odd one that. Um, he was like industrious. A... Oh, he, you he know, worked he, out. He, um, he worked yeah, he out. Did, he, but he, then he did. He put some crosses into the box. You know, first half, but then the longer the game went on, there was nothing there. No, and again, again, this this brings me to I was going to say a couple of things. I, we've kind of covered it already, but I thought picking Ingram, although we had talked about that on the last episode. Yeah, I I asked the question because I I did think it was a possibility, but I still went nah, I'll stick with Long, and I was yeah. surprised to see when when Ingram was picked, and I don't know what that says to George Long. Well, I, I, if I'm honest, I think it says to George Long, you've had eight put past you, so you can't expect to keep your place in the team. It was a shock only to me, only because we haven't seen that much of, of Matt Ingram Good all Trump. season. Yeah. Um, so to see Long benched, on one hand, he's conceded eight. Yeah. So he can't he expect to but stay I in still... the team. But on the other hand, you're playing a keeper who hasn't played football since January and hasn't made a league start in two years. Yeah, that's the other thing. Because if you had somebody, do you remember when we had um, like Boaz and and then we had um, Matt Duke? Duke. Yeah. So you could rely on Duke to come in, couldn't you? 
Yeah, he I could. Know, he, yeah. He, he wouldn't have played, but still, he was still good for that level. And but you could knew... put him in, and you would know what you were getting, and he was exactly. still a good keeper. But with Ingram, exactly. it's that unknown it's such quantity. Such an unknown quality. Yeah, it's just it was just an odd one. And then Elder as captain really shocked me. Yeah, well, you look at you look at the team he was going into, and maybe in terms of appearances, he's not one of the most senior players, but he's probably older than a lot of his others. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes when you look at what international teams do, like Italy, they go with the oldest ca- oldest is captain, don't they? That's that they don't particularly pick it through best player. They they usually have it. If you look at the stats over the last few years. They will always go with the oldest player as the captain because they're the most experienced. I understand that kind of, you know, reasoning behind it. But I mean, one of the things that we spoke about last week with um, younger Joe, Joe Collins, he correctly said that, especially first to half, a lot of their chances were then just coming from the right and were passing in, and, and Elder didn't have the best game. No. And somebody like, I mean, I would have given if I was Grandpa Can. Um, I mean, oh, we want a lost eight eight nil. I want a thought, but because I want to pick that that team <laughs> and that system. But but I would have given it to somebody like Honeyman because I think he's the one who's. I think he's very vocal on the pitch. Either him, him or McGuinness seem to be the most vocal on the pitch. And to me, a captain needs to be vocal. And he needs to be dragging players up and saying, "Don't go feeling sorry for yourself." Like. Honeyman was against Wigan. Yeah. He had a four out of ten game, like we said. He wasn't he wasn't great, he wasn't good at all, but at least he didn't, you know, give up. He was still running himself into the ground and he was still trying to encourage others to not let their heads drop, basically. Um, yeah, I mean I, I, I don't know, there was there was an element of um Elder's game that I liked. I thought first half he looked all right. Um, but then, mm. you know, as, as we faded from the game, he did too. He became less of an influence. You could see him getting frustrated. And all, mm. the, I remember there were instances where you could see him kind of conversing with the referee and trying to, you know, almost lead from the front. But I'm not sure it's something that comes to his game naturally. No, he um, was trying to be somebody who's not in my eyes. I think somebody yeah. like Honeyman, I would imagine it would be a nightmare to ref. Him and Kevin Stewart. I mean, it's, it's when you get the book in, isn't it? Really, yeah, but again, like, even, many... Kevin, even Kevin Stewart, I'm not sure he's a natural leader. No, 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 but I mean, to try and referee, and that when you get the players in your ear is what I'm talking about. Oh, okay, the, those particular styles of players sometimes they lend themselves to be captain, sometimes they don't. I wouldn't argue that Kevin Stewart has done anything or is the kind of player that should be captain, but I think Honeyman would be a similar one because sometimes it just feels like the amount of the, or the lack of voices that you can hear on the feed is quite mm-hmm. startling. Yeah. Because when I've watched, I watch um, some of the Premier League games and I watch, uh, I do writing for MLS and stuff. And I know, you know, it's a different league completely and we're talking about City here. But one thing I will say is that City are one of the quietest teams to watch because if you hear anything, it's usually not City shouting. You look at the amount of shouting that there is on some of those games when you don't have the crowd noise. That's when you have to look at it. Yeah, you know, I mean, you've got that crowd noise p- piped in through Sky. Yeah, when you watch it, you, you, it's less kind of noticeable for me. But you, I don't know. It's one of those things. I think that to a lot of people, the role of a captain is sort of, you know, to be shouting and like. In the right way, I don't a lot. just mean it. Yeah, just, just you, you know, it's it's like that Sunday league thing, isn't it? Like, where's the talking? And it's first and second ball. Yeah, into when they don't like it. Yeah. We've played in games, and I can remember <laughs> like teammates saying, "Like, where's the talking, lads? We're quiet." And, and the first that was thing I say, mate, to be fair, yeah, first thing I'd always <laughs> say was like, "What do you want to talk about?" <laughs> yeah, joker. yeah, so it's well, and, yeah, and I was the bloody captain as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to talk so, about, lads? Just somehow, <laughs> somehow I was captain, Jesus. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's one of those things like you don't just want to be like somebody who's screaming till he's red in the face, but then at the same time, you don't want somebody who's who's going to go quiet a little bit or 
not be able to have an influence on the game. And that's that's maybe why I'd have looked at Honeyman and said him, because yeah. in the last couple yeah. of games, he's been one of the ones that hasn't gone missing. All right, he's not been great with it. He's still not, but his head's not gone down. He's still... Exactly. He's still going looking for the ball, which is bravery mm. in its own way. It's not just about yeah. thundering into challenges or, you know, being a vociferous leader. It's like, if you can be seen to be somebody that's still trying to do your job, then maybe that puts you in as a leadership candidate. Mm. But the thing is, with with the side that he picked and the options that were available to us, there's, there's a paucity of leaders uh, in our team. So, yeah, when and you look at the the leaders that we've had in the previous seasons, when yeah, like, and that's yeah, been that's been a criticism that, yeah, it's been a criticism you could make a city all season is that we yeah. we lack leaders and characters and, and experience, and and it's one of the reasons we find ourselves in the position that we're in because we just don't have that that depth of character or experience to be able to, you know, say that you can hang your hat on him or, yeah, you know. Um, one, a last worrying stat to finish this section off, mate. Mm. Um, linked to, you, you'd said about, you know, lack of leaders means that that's kind of why we're in the position we're in and, and why 2020 has <laughs> been so, so awful. So we have contracts for... No, no, no. I wasn't going to talk about the contracts one. Um, I did see that sort of stuff, but it was something that I'd researched myself for another thing. Um, and when I researched it, it was last week, so it'll be lower now. But I would estimate now, I factor in the other games that we've had um, since 2020, the start of 2020, we obviously won 1 0 at Chef Wednesday on the first day of that year because mm-hmm. it was the away game. Um, Grant McCann now has a less than 5% win rate this year. <laughs> well, yeah. One win in 19. Yeah, I mean, big biggest game of the season, wasn't it? And it's it's come but down that, to it. We rolled over and rolled over that, didn't it? Because yeah, Millwall, did... biggest game of the season. Wigan, yeah, exactly. biggest game of the season. Just... Exactly. I mean, I think I said that in an earlier episode where, mm. you know... We needed to pick up points, but we were running out of road, and and we've had that kind of feel all all throughout 2020. Like even when things were going against us, and we yeah. got got walloped at home to Brentford, and I can remember Burnsy asking McCann saying, "Like I think you're in a relegation fight now," and him saying, "No, I don't think that's the case." And I think we've we're had a promotion the... team. I want to talk. Yeah, yeah, we've we've had that feel all throughout the year where we've not quite got to grips with it, and we keep thinking, "Well, it'll be okay because we've got X amount of games left," and we've got down now to one game, and it's not going to be okay. So no. we don't seem like a team that's quite got our head in the fight, and I think that that really shows in you know the way that the other teams have picked up. And, look at Barnsley. Yeah, you could look at our points total this season and say in any other year it would be enough for yeah, us to but survive. It, but it's not, it, is it? No, which is maybe why um, at the point where we sold Bowen and Grzycki... Mm, they probably they, thought they, I was safe now. Yeah, they, they could have thought yeah. that. They could have yeah, thought that. Done, yeah. What did we have, 39 points? I 39 think, points yeah. and we're eighth. Yeah, so they could have looked at that and said, well, we're, you know, easily enough to stay up. But you have to give credit to the teams below us at that point, Luton, Barnsley, Chow. They were, they were on low numbers and they've got the wins, haven't they? Yeah, they've all done that Steve Bruce thing of going out there and kind of, what's the expression, like get beat with your boots on? Well, they've definitely had yeah. their boots on and we, we've been playing in flip-flops. Um, I think the only bad one for Barnsley was when they got they got walloped by Stoke 4-0, I think. Yeah, but they've responded but to it. Then, but, yeah, Like I said, then they only just lose to Leeds. They beat, they beat Forest, who was chasing promotion. You know, it's just there's when they always say oh, there's no easy games in the championship, there's always an asterisk and it says except all city. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean the other thing that I've forgotten about the game that we maybe didn't touch on is uh, should Luton have been down to ten men? Uh I think if you just give me a second, that was that was something that I'd made a note of previously and missed off. Okay. Um, I want to talk about that. Um and we'll start that the next next segment. Okay. So, this this two... should be fun. Oh yes. <laughs> Give me two minutes. Okay. Right. I've been, I've looked forward to this actually. <laughs> I'm just finding, uh, I actually did <clears throat> for the website I write for, which is uh, Vavil, which I recommend you check out because the coverage is very good. Not by me. Mine's mediocre, but most people's very good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do. I some. I don't always. I often do the reports for City because it means I get to watch it with like a 
a neutral-ish head-on, uh, so I don't get as upset at the end. Uh, don't mix business and pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I say I pleasure. Do, There's been yeah. nothing pleasurable That's what about I mean, it. So I might as well write about it. Um, and sometimes yeah. I might be more harsh on City than the people otherwise would be. Yeah. But um, you, you, how it works is you like sign up, so you have all the fixtures and you write what you want. And I was late getting in on that one, so somebody had already taken the report and the preview, and the only thing left was the live coverage. So I thought, oh, well, I'll just do that anyway. I'm not that bothered. I'm going to read you my. So you know when you have a BBC commentary? Yeah. The text one, it's, it's exactly the same as that. So it updates like every minute and there's new stuff put on. So you're typing it right as you're watching it. So you have to put your minute that something happens on and then a, then a challenge that are like, or what happens. Yeah. So it says um, 53 minutes. Hull will try and to try uh, to get a foothold in the game as they've been under the cosh since the start of the second half, which I'm sure you'd have agreed with that we did. Um, yeah. They changed, and we kind of were on the ropes a little bit. And then I've put 55 minutes. James Collins reacts to McDonald's challenge and headbutts him. Surely the Luton player has to go. And then there's all the argy bargy and everything else. Want they all silly mm-hmm. as usual? Yeah. I've put Collins will be very very lucky if he gets away with this. And then. <laughs> I just oh, I can't believe how angry I was reading like typing this and like being allowed to do it and my editor was saying that this was fine. I've put that is a disgraceful decision. Collins threw himself at McDonald and he should be off the pitch. Hull will be furious, let off for Luton. If he scores today, which he didn't, <laughs> obviously, but obviously no. the other, he, he went off. And then after that, still can't believe that after the replay, Collins should be going for an early bath now. Yeah, I mean, so, to be fair, I'll... what watching it back, it's it's hard to disagree. You know, maybe say, well, well he was on the floor and McDonald's the... McDonald's booted the ball out from underneath him with maybe a little bit more force than perhaps he should have done. I think what he took exception to was the potential. What he well, I think James Fletcher, when I was listening to it, he was the commentator for the Tigers TV, and he said he thought that maybe that there was a little foot left in or a kick out from McDonald. Yeah, I think the ball was trapped under. Um... Collins I don't went. think that was intentional. I think it was it did, like a it, double kind of movement when the, his foot's on no, the floor and he's, he's lifted de- it up. It's not a kick out, no. but he's, he's definitely kicked the ball kind of through Collins' body in a forceful it, manner. He's gone through him, hasn't he? It was a, I, it, it was a, it was a tough about, challenge. I don't know about going through him. It certainly robust the initial challenge, but there's mm. a second one where the ball is sort of lodged between the two of them and, and, and McDonald is definitely... Maybe used a little bit more force than than would yeah. be advisable. Uh, yeah. It's it's probably borderline a foul on McDonald's part. Um, yes, but borderline. when have you seen anybody raise the hands or react to a player like that? It's no, well, exactly, it's... exactly. Even if the foul is given, yeah, um, which it was in the end. Was it? Was it given for the, yeah, the challenge was, by McDonald? They got their, they had the free kick, which they took right. after about five minutes of waiting. Okay, yeah. So, so you know, the foul was given, but then the reaction, even so, is is madness. I mean, I saw somebody comparing it to Zidane, mm. uh, his yeah, head, but in the two thousand and six World Cup final. Don't know if it was quite that. I don't think it was quite as forceful, forceful, and that was very much deliberate, as in like fuck off, get down. Yeah, you could. There was no mistake in no. Zidane's intentions. Collins is a little bit disguised. But he's very badly there. Collins. I mean, it's it, 100% a red card for me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Whether, you know, whether or not it, it would have changed anything, I, I, think, I can't I think, say that we I had enough guile to go. I, I think you're clutching at straws to go. If, oh, if we'd have had 11 exactly. against 10, we'd have won. We probably would have lost 2 0. But that, it, yeah, it's, that's those what I was to. it's those decisions that don't go for you that kind of make you feel that the world's against you. Yeah, and to some degree, I'm you know I'm a believer in the fact that in football you make your own look, and, and yeah. I've read it in a number of books, um, like autobiographies and yeah. kind of you know football books over the years. You make your own, like you make your own look, but you have to control the controllables. And one of those things that isn't a controllable, a refereeing decision. So you need to perform yeah. to a standard that takes 
any decisions that the referee might make out of the equation. All right, sometimes that's not going to be the case. You know, you might do a good job of nullifying a threat and then get a bad penalty against you or something like that. Yeah. But in general, if you play to a, a level where you can say whatever the referee does isn't necessarily going to affect us, then you can have no arguments. Um, yeah, I often think when people say, oh, well, it's the ref's fault we conceded, but if he's given a free kick... Then you have to defend that situation. You, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You've got to defend it, and you can't just go, well, that wasn't a free kick. Because even shouldn't if you're have, right... You shouldn't have given right, the free right. kick, yeah. Yeah, shouldn't have given yeah. the free kick. And it's just like, yeah, but you, you, you've you got different variables after that that you can control. Yeah. So rather than just go, oh, it's unfair, I'm not trying. I'm not saying City did that, but... That's sometimes in the mind of people. If you get on the end of a bad decision, you know, and and everyone's done that. You know, you you blame the ref because that's the easiest thing to do. But actually, yeah. you can't. And it maybe it, it maybe goes back to that that lack of um, mental robustness in our side. I mean, well, yeah. I don't think the game hinged on that decision. Um, I think Luton but... got a little bit more spirit. After that, yeah, they, they, they had two or three chances where if, they, actually the referee did us a favour because if he'd have played advantage, they had two over. Yeah, at that point. yeah, they did. But if if they'd had Colin sent off at that point and it was reasonably early in the first half, would they have carried on in the ascendancy in the same way? Well, they did. I'm just not sure. Ten behind the ball, wouldn't they? Yeah, maybe maybe they'd have done that. And then do we not have the guy? I don't know. Do we yeah. have the guy in creativity to break that down <laughs> in that team? I don't know. Uh, probably not in the eleven that he picked. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's all ifs and maybes, but to me, he, he got that decision wrong. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. And so we did just want to touch on that. That wasn't something we initially said we would talk about, but that did come back to me straight away. And I was like, oh yeah, I wanted to talk about that, and I forgot to, to mention it. Um, so I mean, it wouldn't have had a bearing on the game, I don't think. There's so no, many ifs and buts, as you say, you know, but it was we... an unfortunate thing for. Well, it's fortunate <laughs> for them and unfortunate for us. Let's not let one decision that, that didn't go our way disguise the fact that we went... No, we didn't deserve to get anything out of the game. We, we went 88 minutes without having a shot on target. I know, they, that, yeah. I know the official line is that we didn't have a shot on target, but Honeyman definitely did have one in the first half from a, yeah. a wide free kick that had to be tipped over. But other than that, did we look like scoring? No. Not really. No, not really. Luke deservedly won the game, you know, the, the chances yeah. that they were making in that second half and the balls that they were putting into the box, that they just played with far, far more intent than us. Um, it's the counter-attacks as well towards the end. They looked dangerous when Luan yeah, they, came on. They did, but he's he's a he's a dangerous player. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, somebody that we've seen a little bit of. Um, so, like I say, when he came on, we knew it was going to be going to be one of those things you had to look out for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the next thing we was going to get to was um, your, well, we said yours would be Tom Eaves. Yes. So, yeah. Um, I spoke, I think, in our first kind of match preview episode, mm. uh, when we had Bobby Hadgraft on talking about the teams that we would pick for the, the, the first game back. Tom Eaves, I said I would have him in for his his goal threat, and, you know, in, in the hope that he would have learned from the, the difficult experience of his, of his kind of introduction to championship football. Yeah. Don't think he's done that. I don't no. think he's learned. Um, he no, looks, I'd agree with that. He's one of those players, uh, in spite of myself, um, when he came in, I can remember looking at the goals that he was scoring for Gillingham, and, and you know, granted it's a stand below uh, where we're playing now. Uh, be our standard next year, mate. Yeah, well, yeah, there might be a chance of redemption for the guy. Um, <laughs> but I wanted it to work for him. Um, yeah. You know, he spoke in his initial interview very well. Um, and I seemed, I, I was hopeful for him. Um, mm. He seemed excited to come in and he wanted to prove himself. So he's one of those that I wanted it to work out for him. I can remember people getting on his back early on in the season where he played like six games for us and saying he looked like a donkey and stuff like that. And that. Mm kind of hitting out at them saying, you know, he's, if he if he is um, as bad as you say he is, then you've got the striker that you deserve because you've given up on the guy after six games. Um, yeah, I mean, you do see, you know, many strikers go through barren patches at the start. If, they, if they're going up a level, sometimes it's yeah, hard exactly. to acclimatise. So it's you've got to figure it out. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately for him, we've, we've run out of time in which he's able to do that. And yeah. it, it, he really, really hasn't got to grips with the level. He's not got to grips with 
really any aspect of, of, of playing as a lone striker in the championship. He's not a goal threat. He doesn't hold the ball up well. He breaks play down for us when we're trying to clear up. I tell you what he does. Play around. Wind. He gives away so many oh, fouls. That, that was the one I was going to say. Of the amount of times I'm tearing the air out going, just fucking stop it. Yeah, stop I mean, doing there's, that. There is there's no nothing subtle in there. No, and it's not even like it's not even obvious elbows or anything. It's just he's two hands on with his hands. And he's yeah, the rest of the defenders at this level it. are too clever to get done by that. Yeah, yeah. So if you're going to back into them and your arms all over, you'll get the free kick given against you all day. And I just don't think he's he's switched onto it. So he's not been for me really a viable option. Um, no, you know, and I think I think when I picked him to start. It was it was more out of hope rather than expectation because let's face it we you know supported the team a lot of this season based on hope rather than expectation of them doing anything. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's it's gone the other way for Eves. Um, whether he'll be able to establish himself with us in in League One, I don't know. Um, he's played that standard before, and he he knows it, and he's done well there. He's obviously excelled; otherwise, he wouldn't have got to move up the divisions. But in the championship, he's just struggled so badly. It's and you can see him almost bereft of confidence and ideas. He doesn't know mm. what to do to get himself into games. It's like I everything still he think, tries. I still think that if he does, I mean, I spoke to um, I spoke to a Gillingham fan um, that I've kind of got the acquaintance of by by doing the writing that I do called uh, Lewis Browning. So he writes the same site, and we we chatted about Tom Eaves, and he said. It depends on the day because if you've got a referee that's going to let the game go, particularly in, in League One, because he's talking about watching him for Gillingham, mm-hmm. then you know he's he's. I mean, I compared him. I don't know if anyone else has used this ever, but I haven't seen it. This is just what came to mind. It's like if you ordered Andy Carroll off Wish, because <laughs> he's got the he's got the man bun, he's got the long hair and stuff, and he's physical and. I mean, you all seen like the goals that you know were in by Andy Carroll in the twenty um, twenty twelve Euros when he he thundered that header, you know, for, against Sweden. Yeah, you think, and and there was a there's a goal Eve scored for us against Chef Wednesday at home that was kind of similar in, in some brilliant respect. header. It's one of my goals of the season. That yeah, I, that it was a great goal. Um, and you think, well, why isn't he doing that more often? And he said that it very much depends on how lenient the referee is with his physicality because he's always going to be a physical player. And yeah. I just think he's not got the nous to go, right, he's blown for that. It's the third minute. If I do that again, he's probably going to blow. But in mm. fairness to Eves, <laughs> it isn't something that's just limited to him. The amount of times our centre-backs, when they go up from a honeymoon free kick and we get the, the whistle goes almost straight away for pulling, yeah. and it's like, what are you doing? You've got, and you might be keen to get the ball, but you've got to stop doing that because how many times has that happened over the last five or six games that yeah. we're trying to pump the ball into the box and use the the physical presence that a lot of the time we have? It's Burke or it's Device or then it's like it's Taffer's early or whoever it is who's playing always gives the free kick away and teams maybe are that smarter little bit, than us. It's that being almost too eager to get to it, you know that that yeah. edginess because yeah. um, we're playing without. Oh, we're, we're playing with anxiety, yeah. Um, so that's maybe where that comes from. But then you it's learn the from it. Desperation of it, I don't know. I just don't think Tom Eves has has, has got it. Um, in, not in terms of ability. But I think mm. that's at, at Championship. You know, people have probably drawn their own conclusions about it, and 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 it would be hard for me to argue with them with what we've seen. Um, but when I say I don't think he's got it, I don't think he's he's got. He hasn't come to terms with what is required of him with his skill set. Yeah, he doesn't know how to make the best of his own talent, does he? No, no. I think there, but... there would have been there would have been cause to maybe put somebody like Keen Lewis Potter up top with him and see how he does with a striking partner. But McCann just does not seem to want to budge with that. No, he won't. And to me, it was we were so. We were so stodgy in the way that we attacked. And like I said earlier on, I, I quite liked the back-to-basics approach, but that was more of how we we sort of defended. And, and, and then maybe if you do get the ball long, but then when you have the likes of um, Wilkes on and, and, and 
like we've said earlier uh, or in other episodes, that he's, he's 21 and with his experience, some of his decisions aren't always the most consistent when he's going forward. And then you've got McGuinness who's a square peg in a round hole. And a number nine who is just struggling to establish himself in games individually, never mind in you know the championship over the, the course of the season. So mm. how much of an attacking threat is there? And to, to say that, you know, I've been hesitant to, recommend that he should put Keane Lewis Potter in. Now's the time, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, that moves me on to my point because I was wanting, I was gutted for, for Lewis Potter because when he came on against Wigan, he was one of the players, along with Honeyman, I would argue, that really gave his all in a hopelessly lost cause. Yeah, um, and you could see it on his face afterwards. He was, you know, he, he was, was gutted. absolutely gutted. He was probably and he was the, the same on Saturday. Crying. Yeah, yeah, he was the was. same on Saturday. He got he was 10 down minutes, his... though, mate. He got 10 minutes. I know. What's he going to do then? I know. The one player that played with Art against Wigan, and you reward him with 10 minutes off the bench, I'd have been furious. And the players he's bringing on have not done anything more to merit a place than Lewis Potter has. I mean, he's, no, he's I mean... Brought, he brought Scott on, and he didn't make well, that many Lu- subs, did he? Lewis, Lewis Potter came on on the 88th minute. That's it. I mean, what, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing with that? He came on much earlier against Wigan, but that was when we was already... I think we were 8-0 down anyway. Um, uh, it was 7, seven I think. Right. Did he come on at half-time? No, I he came re- on just I after. Remember. He came on about 55 minutes-ish. I, I switched off. <laughs> not not literally, <laughs> but... You because know. for a little time, we did have two up top, and then we didn't concede for 10 minutes. We thought, oh, hallelujah. And then um, <laughs> he took him off. He took he took the Guinness off, or he eaves mm. off. I can't remember which. And he, and he put Lewis Potter on. And there was what one driving run, which I want to see him make. I want to see him get the ball and, and run at defenders because they shit themselves when he had the ball. That was the only time he really looked dangerous was when he and he was upended in the air. He wanted a penalty and the referee overturned his own decision. But at yeah. least he had the, the, the nous and the he's, he's obviously got natural ability on the ball. I know he's a young lad, but he wants to... Desire as well at that yeah, stage. Yeah, he know? wants to prove himself. He's his hometown club and... He should have been. I know the amount of changes he made. He made six changes, didn't he? Yeah. He should have been one of them. He should have. Started. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, that's maybe something we could touch on. It, you know, a little bit is kind of his his like lack of willingness to to kind of shake things up in an attacking sense. Full stop. Mm. So Lewis Potter didn't play. Um, He's Scott Scott sa- came off the bench. So Scott yeah, he signed playing. the likes. Of, he signed the likes of Scott and Samuelson, and he doesn't seem to back either of them. Was Samuelson to... on the bench on Saturday? He was, yeah. And he still didn't yeah. bring him on, did he? Not saying he would have made a great deal of difference, because to me, he's looked lightweight and maybe a little bit naive. Um, I think that's the way know. he played him against West Brom, though, because he played him on the wing, and for me, he's more of a central player. Right. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe your view is different to mine, but he did give away I've silly three the... kicks against uh, West Brom. Fair... Didn't do himself any favors. No, to be fair, I've not seen enough of the kid. I'm not. I'm not suggesting yeah. that I would have put him in, or that he would. If he played, he would have been the difference maker. Mm. What I am seeing is that McCann has these options in his squad, and these are two players that he's brought in himself. Yeah, and, um, and he's not. He doesn't seem willing to put them in. You know, I would. Be... Again, keep saying it. It was our biggest game of the season. It was. It really was shit or bust. And yeah. this speaks to a wider th- a wider point: a about McCann's management and b about the Luton game individually. We did not react when Luton made those changes. We didn't react <laughs> and give them something to worry about. It was almost more like they get Luton were getting to grips with the game, getting the better of us. They were in the ascendancy, and we did nothing. We did yep. nothing to counteract that, and that's not just something that we've seen on Saturday. That has Damn happened. Him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so that's twice in lockdown that's or post lockdown that sort yep. of cost us points. But that's all season where we've not been able to adapt to changes within the game and and, and change the way that we do things to give the opposition problems. And it's almost like if he's going to stick or twist, he doesn't know what twisting's going to get him. So he just thinks, well, I'll stick because at least mm-hmm. I know what I'm getting out of this. This is the way that they're playing. And if he, if he brings players in, it's like, oh, well, I don't know about that. I cannot, I can't, I can't come to terms with, with this, what looks to me like a hesitancy to, 
to throw everything at the game. Um, mm. I just can't come to terms with it. I mean, you look at Luton, they made three changes in in very quick succession. And, you know, Luau, Luau only got 20 minutes, but he proved to be the difference maker. And it was at a point where the game was turning for them. It mm. really was turning. And, and we just never got to grips with it. No, we didn't at all, did we? Um, I think if, if we end this section and then we want to um, potentially talk about that second half in a bit more detail... Um, before we uh, before we discuss other things, maybe uh, the Cardiff game coming up as well. Um, <laughs> oh, Jesus! Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, give me two minutes, and we'll, okay. we'll be back. Right. So, last couple of things. Um, we're kind of touching it already, but. That thing of not pushing the issue again in the second half, you know, not not making the right changes. One thing I was going to ask you about is, is it indicative of McCann being out of his depth or are his coaching team as inept as him? Don't know. That's difficult for me to say, uh, regarding his coaching team at least. Because um... the, the only reason I ask, and I know it's not answer, but surely... <laughs> you listen to your assistants or other coaches that you've got. You listen to your team. Ultimately, you're the manager. So if you're Grant McCann, you know you you make the final decision, or you would hope that that is the case, and it's not Ehab picking a team for you. But if there is something that I mean, that's why you have an assistant, surely, to get a, a different voice, maybe a different approach with the players. You know. Or if, press, if, you know, a different voice at press conferences, maybe. That's it. Well, <laughs> yeah, asking why somebody else is not interviewing yeah. you. Go and, crack um, some, go and crack some jokes, Cliff. Yeah. <laughs> what was it uh, Joe, Joe Appleyard said last week? In his shorts in minus 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's, I, that's that's just one of the things I, w- I wanted to kind of touch on with it, because surely at some point he's got to go gaffer. It's the same old thing again. We're getting overrun at the start of the second half. I wonder what's going on. And surely they they can see it. They sit high enough up in the stands that they can have a look. I mean, I'll have some of his team further up where they can go right. Well, I can see that they've switched that. It's surely it's obvious. Surely. Well, to, I mean, to everyone watching, it was uh, at least on the stream. Um, obviously, we ca- we can't speak to what's being discussed between no, the coaching no. staff. What I would be interested in knowing is is what the thought processes were around why they didn't change it. You know, when it seemed so obvious, we were labouring to create anything. You know, yeah. we had our, our sole shot on target was in the second minute and it was from a free kick that maybe you could say it wasn't even an intentional shot. Um, yeah. or it caused the keeper some problems, but did he intend to, to put it on him like that? I don't know. But then we've gone another 43 minutes without looking like scoring. We're into the second half. The end of the first half, you probably like fairly even Stevens, you know, nil nil. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we said, both teams weren't playing. And then Luton came out with greater intent, and and they established themselves. You know, they 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 were able to put their game plan into work f- far better than we did. So what? How is he watching that? Watching what's going on, knowing the stakes or what's at stake, and knowing that we needed to win the game. And, and, and coming to the conclusion that he didn't need to change it until the 76th minute. Mm. Um, mm, that's the worrying thing, isn't it, really? Yeah. And as, mm. as we said, it's it's something that's that's happened all season. I'd be interested to know how he's watching or what he's watching and, and, and his thought process behind not changing it. it. It doesn't make sense to me. I would want to be, as a coach, proactive and at times, he's almost gone too early with changes. I, I keep harping back to it every time that we talk about these issues because it's the one it's the one that really sticks out to me is the Huddersfield away game earlier in the season. Yeah. Nil yeah. nil, we made changes to go and win the game to open us up. Yeah, we got and, done, and we got done. So his decision making process around tactical adjustments, yeah, there's something not entirely right there. But, you know, he could maybe justify them to us and he's not here to do that. So in a way, it's it's a little bit unfair, but, you know, we are fans and we've, we've got as much right to comment about it, having paid the money and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
to our eyes, it looks odd. I don't understand how he how he was watching that game. If we're focusing only on Saturday, I do not understand how he's watched it and said, yeah. I don't need to do anything about this. Mm. Um, mm. And even when he did make a change to kind of bring Scott on for ease, it's not like he's changed the system. The system's the same. It remained the same. He's just Scott's gone wide. Yeah, this like, has gone I mean, inside. Like we said, you know, I said when I saw the team, I thought, oh, hello, two up top. And then you looked at the midfield and gone, hang on, that doesn't add up that. Mm. And it's just that's just baffling because it, it it's, all, it's almost like he's trolling you, just just, yeah. to, just to try and go. Hey, <laughs> look, we're going to put two strikers on the pitch. Oh, we're going to play one of them out of position. No, don't worry, lads, we're still shit. <laughs> it, it just baffled because at, at first I thought, oh well, fair play. He's listened. Maybe that's what he's been doing in hiding. You know, when he when when he sent Cliff Burn for the presser, maybe he was rewatching games that he should have been doing. You know, like the fans do, and go. Well, maybe he's been doing some of his own video analysis. Maybe he realizes that we might as well have a shot or two up top, and then he didn't do that at all. <laughs> just, just bizarre, bizarre stuff. Really, is odd. Extremely frustrating to watch as well. You know, the yeah. longer it went on, and, and the yeah. more obvious it became that we weren't going to do anything to force the issue. And you could mm. see the goal coming for them. You know, the num. They, oh, they it have... was coming way before, wasn't it? Yeah. As soon as they made that change, I thought he's dangerous. Him, but they there's two of them who came on. They, they, they dragged wider the post, didn't they? Um... There was Heinemann on the right hand side uh, just before. Yeah, it was him. He'd come on and he'd cut inside, and then that was a decent effort. To be fair, oh Hil- Hilton, sorry, Hilton. Was... So that's it. That's it. Uh, Hilton, but it, um, the lad who came on just, I think he came on at the same time as Luwalawar actually. Yeah, um, he did. He did. And then but they then, brought Monker then, on yeah, shortly afterwards. Yeah, because they both really dangerous. And then he's obviously yeah. had the shot and, it, and it's gone. It was at 84 minutes, I think, on it. And Something, it was just yeah. like, I mean, I, I hate to be proved wrong sometimes because I said to you last last episode, I think we'll lose 1-0. And that's what happened. I didn't put money on it. Should have done. <laughs> um, but it, you could just see it, couldn't you? In you know, the last yeah. few games, we've just not scored. We didn't score against Millwall. We didn't score against Wigan. We didn't score against Luton. All games that... You know, maybe Millwall aside, I mean, they can't get the playoffs now, but they played a very unconventional way that in the end we matched up, but still got out coached with, mm. didn't we? Because then he went match for match and they were like, well, we're 1 0 up, mate. Fine. Don't need yeah. to score. And yeah, then what he should have done. You can, can neutralise us all you field. like. Yeah, neutralise us, but, but we're already ahead. So what, what does it get you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, that was that was just one of the other things I wanted to kind of tie in with a with a second yeah. half. I, I'd love to have the opportunity. It's not going to happen. No, I'd love to speak to Grant McCann about what what oh, he's I looking would. at in games. Um, I, would, I, I would love you know, to hear his of, reasoning behind the yeah. decisions he makes. I wouldn't I wouldn't shout at him. I wouldn't have a go at him. I wouldn't call him all names in the sun because I don't think that's helpful particularly. No, I mean obviously I would... he's not going to come on a podcast and no. explain himself to the likes of us because he doesn't need to. But no, he didn't need as, to do as, that. As, as a fan and somebody who's interested in football, I'd, I'd love to. I'd know. love to chat football with him, mate. Yeah, I'd, I'd love, love to go. Right, why is it you prefer four three three? What is it about that system that endears you to it? That would be my not, first question. Not even that, because I mean, you know, I won't. I won't get into like, as we said before, like my Pep Guardiola kind of tactics <laughs> fetish, where you get your two. Yeah, you're top a proper three. Barca boy, aren't you? Yeah, to stretch the pitch as wide as you possibly can and. Mm. Give give the space to the lads inside to you know open the pitch up and you drag your fullbacks out to deal with the opposition's fullbacks out to deal with your wide men and you create pockets I don't of space. Think, to be fair, we I don't, don't think do we that. Get, yeah, we we're not playing like that. Side than uh, than Barcelona of that no. era that you're talking about. No, exactly. So that's like the very highest standard of of, of that system. Because I mean, you, you look at you look at what Pep's done at Man City. He plays exactly the same way. Um, and, yeah, and, in terms and of Klopp, fundamentals, and but he's, he's not kind of turned he's, that position into. He's, he's kind of made it a little bit more high pressing than it ever was. They still did the high press though, Barca. Then if they lost the ball, they won it back straight away. Yeah, you saw for call of the ball. He got the the odd result where it was you know Celtic winning two one at at um, at their place when they had I think it was nineteen percent possession. Yeah, but they're they're but complete they're freaks, rare. aren't they? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, we've spoken about it before. Possession for the sake of it. Sometimes mm. we've done that. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Where we've, I think what was what was the game where he said that we had most of the ball? It was the uh, Charlton game. Yeah, it was. It was. So I know that one of the 
the principles of, of Pep Guardiola for having possession was that he always used to say that Barcelona were a horrible team without the ball. They couldn't defend. And, you know, they had like Mascherano playing as a centre-back because of his ability with the ball. So what yeah. his idea was, we'll have the ball and then our opposition can't hurt us as long as we've got the ball. You defend with the ball. We don't do that. Can we you still... imagine? Just just one one question for you. You know that rule now this season where the the defenders can go inside the box and receive the ball? Can you imagine if Barca could have done that then? <laughs> uh, <laughs> It'd have been ten percent possession. Yeah. Teams, I think. But, hell, I, like, I like I liked watching that team, but I know, you, I know. that's that's a ridiculous comparison to make. It's a massive extreme. No, no, no. What, no. what, what you're trying to say is that if you've got a certain style of play, you do it because you've got. There's always going to be something to a system where you think, well, they can be got at there. Yeah, but then yeah. just looking at the tweaks of, well, how do we counter it? So they what don't I, seem to be able to do that. No. So what I would be interested in is why four three three feels works for us, but more than that, like more than being interested in in the way that he sets us up, just to watch a game and take it at face value. Like, okay, fair enough. That's how he wants to set us up. But then like, Saturday, we're four three three. Luton are playing. Whatever they played, I'm not. Well, they play a so. diamond. They play four, 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 one, two, one, two. Really. Right. So what I would like to know is then they did switch that though. When when Luton make those changes second half, what's he seeing that says I don't need to make a change here? Because to me, it's like he's crying out for it. Well, they went four four two, didn't they? They they made sure yeah. that the midfield was more compact, and that's where they won it. Yeah. So I would just love to know. That, you know, that's the last time I'll say it. I'd like, to, but it's not. I would <laughs> like to <laughs> immediately prove myself wrong. <laughs> I would like to know why you're seeing it and just saying I don't need to change it. Yeah. We'll never, yeah. we'll never find out. But it's no. when you're watching it, it's so frustrating. It really it's is. crying out for a change. It was. It was. Um, one of the other things I just wanted to kind of touch on and and maybe just a little bit of chat. There was a lot of. Well, there was some coverage given at the end of the game because some City fans had, had took it upon themselves to, to have a protest where they'd purposely block the the exits so someone would have to come and not negotiate with them, but you know they'd, they'd have to speak to somebody because their their aim was they wanted to vent their anger at. at I think it's first first and foremost it's the owners, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um. And obviously, I'm not against the the, the intentions behind that were, were absolutely admirable. And I think it's always something that, you know, when we've had demonstrations before, you know, we've got no to hold Tigers badges and everything, haven't we? Yeah. Um, we, we're not pro Alam because, you know, we, we don't want to go into a, to a whole load of discussion about, you know, what How we feel about. Got? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but what's but it's all been said before. This yeah, it's a massive thing. echo chamber. Yeah. If, if you're listening to this, you probably don't like a lamb and you support City unless you're giving this podcast a go because you just you heard about it from somebody else and it's not your team. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So we don't need to talk about that. But the the thing I did want to say was the fact that Taffers early had to come out and then reason with the fans, it's almost like the whole thing was a not a pointless gesture, but the fans were shocked that someone had come and spoke to them. And because it was a player that they really couldn't criticise for, for, as they put it, not giving his all or whatever, they, they, they weren't venting their anger towards that. The fact that then <laughs> they tried to use Taffers early as a mouthpiece to then go back to the others and say, they don't like you. <laughs> Just, <laughs> do you know what I'm trying to say? I do. Um, I'm not trying to criticise those people that went and demonstrated because you know you if you, that's that's your right if you think it's going to make a difference. I mean, protests have made a difference all over history, haven't they? That sometimes they've made a difference, sometimes they haven't. And but the only thing for me would be that it made the protest look a little bit more futile when you're you're sending taffers early. Go back to to Grant McCann and Ehab and say they're not wanted because yeah, get rid of that. It's Tell them to, to sign some new players or something like that, I think. Yeah. They're saying. <laughs> like, oh, God. Yeah. Just make yourself look a little bit daft. Like you, I really, 
I think the fact that they feel strongly enough about the situation to go down and protest a yeah. game that they can't get into, I think that's admirable. Yeah. Um, yeah. We said to Joe last week when he was talking about his, his rant post-Wigan, um, yeah. that that sort of passion is not something that the club deserves at the moment. No, no. And, and, no, and I would right. say the same to the mm. people that went and... and protested the amount of effort that some of them kids would have gone through to get to the ground and and to to have organized that in the first exactly yeah but then you know it's almost like Tafazoli comes out to talk to them and he says that the players are hurting and it's affecting their lives and there's people crying in the changing room and things like that yeah i would believe that but then yeah it's just make yourself look a little bit silly for me when you say things like tell the manager that we don't want him and stuff like that because Tafazol is not then going to go like oh yeah we don't want him either you know he's I don't he's, know he's employed I, by I, the, he's an employee of the club you know yeah he, I, he, look what happened to Nick Barnby when he criticised the owners and say how far yeah, that got yeah. him because isn't he still banned from the stadium to watch I, City. I have no idea. I, I mean, no idea. that's that's what I'd heard anyway. But he, he didn't keep his job, did he? He, he spoke ill of the arms <laughs> on radio and beside, allegedly. And then he, he went, and then we had Bruce. And obviously we had those Bruce years that, you know, was like a... It seems so long ago now. It's God, not really, is it? it? But, it, I mean, it. he was there for four years, Bruce, weren't he? And we were in the Premiership. Well, no, we had... Well, five. it would have been five seasons, but... Took us up at the first time of asking, kept us up, FA Cup final. Then we went down the season after, then come straight back up. And it was after we come straight back up that he just felt that he wasn't being supported enough and he walked, didn't he? Because yeah. then that's that was the kind of beginning of the end for many people. But again, Taff as early, he's not going to say, yeah, I agree with you, lads. Yeah, Let's, with, let's with open the, the gates and let's get, let's get to his car and turn it over. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Let's have it on its roof. Uh, what, what an image. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Taff only leading the riots. <laughs> um, with, me, no, I mean, with, with the greatest respect to Taff Azzoli as well, he's been with the club for a year and he's got another year on his contract. It, yeah. it, it might be that Hull City is just a, it's just a stop in his mm-hmm. career and he can't speak to the wider issues. And, you know, maybe he's got no appreciation for it. I felt for him a little bit being put out as the... The, he looks uh, awkward. I mean, fair play for him for coming out. Yeah, fair and, play for doing that and, because that's and, that's a tough thing to do. Don't don't get me wrong. I don't want to be critical of anybody that's going down to protest because I no, fully no. sympathise with it. Yeah. My thing, my thing is it with it is now that we've seen protest after protest in whatever guys have taken. You know, red cards, scrap the scheme, tennis balls. Um, the alarms you know, go when the alarms want to go, don't they? I just don't know how much effect protesting has on making people sell a business. Um, you know, you can sign petitions, you can have a march. and The attention has been there over the years on, on um, you know, these sorts of things where we, we've seen that protests maybe don't necessarily work. I don't want to criticise it. I don't yeah, know what, yeah. I, I don't know, I don't know what, what is the best course of action? To no, take? you see what they've done. You say, well, yeah, I, I admire that. I don't know if it's going to work, but I don't know what the alternative is. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there comes a point where people almost not being able to attend games and and, and vent frustration in the terraces. It's like that. Mm. That has to go somewhere. And yeah, for some of us, that's you know talking about it on Twitter with fellow fans. And for some people, it's going down and taking action, which I think is you know, like I say, it's admirable. I just don't yeah. know what it achieves. So well, that that was the the last thing I really wanted to touch based on on the uh, on the Luton game. Any thoughts going into the last game? Because it's it's a very unlikely scenario that we stay up. Um, um, do you, do you think he'll go wholesale again? Do you think he'll keep the same team? I don't know. I don't know at this point. I really don't. Um, whether or not he believes it. He was saying after the game that there's still a chance we could stay up, so I think he'll still be, <laughs> he'll, yeah, yeah, <laughs> he'll still go four three three. Yeah, I think he'll still be picking a team that he thinks he, you know can win a game. I don't think he'll have an eye on next year. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, I think it's more likely than not that we'll get beat. Yeah. Um, I'll be watching for some reason. 
Yeah, me too, because it, I mean, it's the last one in it. So yeah, you, you just do it, don't you? Um, yeah, um, but it just you know that was that was the game for me that that kind of confirmed it. They might as well have put the R next to our name after Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Especially so, with Barnsley then winning the next day, and we went to bottom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I know people keep talking about the. Um, the possibility of Sheffield Wednesday having a points deduction. I, I honestly don't think that that's going to happen this season. No, I, no not I for Chef Wednesday anyway. I think, and that... I, I think whatever happens, it's likely that even if there is a point deduction for Sheffield Wednesday, it's not going to apply this year. No, we will go down deservedly. Yeah. So, yeah, we haven't deserved to stay up, um, and I think it's more likely that that situation plays out in court. Yes, then. Then it it's does. going to be. I think it's going to be a messy summer. Yes, I think so. On you know on that front, um, and then the other thing is, really, what good does staying up on an accounting technicality <laughs> do us? I know. Yeah. I, I know it. Going down is is probably more. It, well, it's definitely more harmful than staying up on an accounting technicality. But that's. For me, not the way that sport should be decided, and and we all know it as all City fans. We've been rancid. We've really, we really have been since Christmas, or since since New Year's Day, and the way that the way that we are at the moment, from the way that we play on the pitch to everything up above that, we are not a Championship club, and we do not deserve to be in this division. No, I mean, if you'd think that we deserve to stay up, I think people are killing themselves with with optimism, really, and you're just misguided, yeah. in fairness. Yeah. I mean, it's... And that hurts to say that, doesn't it? Because yeah, it we're does. City fans and we want, we want the best for the club, but, you know, we have shown such a lack of fight and and desire to stay in this division when all the other teams around us have been picking up points and we've just slid from 8th to 24th. We, we deserve everything we're getting. And it's it's not just this season. It's a lot of... Um, it's it's a lot of years of, of really, really poor decision-making coming mm. home to roost. And, and, and this is where we are. I was having a discussion with somebody on Twitter, um, Dave Weldrick, who I sit next to at yeah. KC. Um, I have done since the stadium opened. That's how I know him. Um, yeah, yeah. The... the um, the, it, it, it feels like it's further to fall at the moment just because of the way that things are. Yeah. Uh, can't see a change. I know Phil Buckingham said that we'll have we'll have um a bud you know a a larger budget for League One, you know, compared to other sides within League One. Whether that'll be spent, I don't know. When the league comes back, we don't know. I know they're talking about grassroots football, but what's the plan look like for League One? Mm. Um there's a lot of unknowns, but at the minute it's just hard to feel anything but the negativity about the way that things are going. And yeah. and, and tomorrow night is it's just going to underline that, isn't it? Because that's when the relegation will be confirmed, and and you know that's that's where we cease to be a championship club. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's best, grim, isn't it? It's first grim. time since two thousand and five when we played yeah. in the third tier of English football. And it's it's a very very different um, it's a very different football club from the last time. We yeah, because we were very one. much on the up, weren't we? Yeah, we were. Last time I, it was. I mean, all, all those episodes where we talked to you know Figs and uh, even into you know, Rod Rodney Rowe was kind of where we had that first push and we just fell away. But obviously the squad was invested in so much, wasn't it? We finally yeah. got Taylor in. We got up. You know, Fagan came and Fagan came in and Colchester and, and and that was the, that was the time where if if we had a, we, we were we were big big fish in a small pond, weren't we? Then? Yeah, we we were attacking that division, and it don't feel the same way. The club feels a lot smaller than the last time it it went mm. into to League One. You know, fan base has shrunk, ambition shrunk. It we is are, mad when you think about it, isn't it? That we used to yeah. get twenty twenty two thousand regularly. Yeah, in we're fifty the third tier. We're fifteen years on, and not a lot. You know, in the infrastructure of the clubs, 
they haven't grown. If anything, it's it's like the recession of whole city at the moment. Mm. And and I just think that that is such a shame that we've gone through one of, if not the greatest period in in the club's history, and and we're almost in a worse situation than when we started it. Yep. Um, it's going to be a return of the dark days like we were in when we were at Boothry, I think, under well, Fish and then David Lloyd. And then different Keith sort Cannon. of dark dark days, but no, definitely no less um, no less difficult if you're a fan yeah. of the football club. You know, yeah. there's, there's, there's different different shades of black. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we might, we might not get locked out the ground and, no. you know, what have you, but it, it's still very difficult. It's all relative to the experience, isn't it? You know, there'd be a lot yeah. of fans who weren't around in 1995 or, you know, whatever period, David Lloyd or the Sheffield Mafia or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, Sheffield Mafia, yeah. <laughs> Gary Fellows, <laughs> but, apparently, in Cliff and Buchanan. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, to, to a lot of people, they'll be experiencing this for the first time. So it's you know it's, it's going to be it's going to be a long old slog. I think being a city fan for the next few years. Yep. Well, we live in hope still for tomorrow, but do we? You might. <laughs> I was trying to be positive, but you, <laughs> you've ruined that one. So for the, um, I'm sure we'll be back after the game for maybe a, a roundup. Um, and then it might be uh, till the new season. It it may be uh, maybe a little time for a bit of a break. I'm not sure. Um, we'll, we'll have to see how we feel. I think after the inevitable tomorrow, little bit bruised at the moment. Yeah, um, but I'm sure we come back with a second season from League One. Um, but I think we need to have a once once the Cardiff game is done and dusted. I think we need to have a bit of a reflect. So we'll be back for another episode. I think. Um, and then we'll have to have a discussion as to where we we go from there. But uh, we probably have our last game as a Championship club coming up, don't we? So we'll have to see what what those players are made of, and if there's any fight. I'd rather go down fighting. You know, well, in, we haven't we haven't though, have we? No, I know we haven't. But <laughs> if, if they're going to turn up and actually try and show that they actually have something about them. If we if we win and, and the results don't go our way, then fair enough. You can't really criticise that single performance, can you? It's it's the it's a bigger picture as a whole, I think, because we've just not been good enough across the second half of the season. But yeah, it's gonna it might be a tough watch tomorrow. Or rather today when this is published. Yeah, I suspect <laughs> it will be. But we'll 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 watch anyway because we're masochist. Indeed. Yes. So um until next time, we will see you soon. Take it easy.